His first round, 78-16, was the lead by Dag Benlund of Sweden. British record holder at 85 metres 24. Has made a late start to the year, but he's coming into form nicely. That's a good effort there. Not quite as far as Venlund. And he won't be too worried about that. He wants to be right over 85 metre form at the Olympics. Shakes his head there because he knows there's a lot more that he can get out from this spear. And it was 76 metres 90 as we look again at the 23-year-old. Second in the Commonwealth Games here in Edinburgh and into the blue strip between the 75 and 80 metre lines. The rest of Britain's top competitors, Otley, Bradstock, not here today. And Stephen Backley, of course, has been in Canada competing in the World Junior Championships. And certainly the trials in the Javelin next week will be thrilling ah. with those four and Mick Robeson all over the Olympic qualifying standard. So that was Hill's best, 76.90. Well then, down with me here at trackside, two 5,000 metre boys, Dave Moorcroft and Jack Buckner, getting a bit of a speed test, I suppose. Uh, how did you enjoy the handicap mile, David? Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, mean, I, was, I was very pleased with my run. I think, you know, bearing in mind the wind and everything, maybe we were a bit too far back to really get into it. And it's a real difficult position to be in, the two of us, and Adrian Passy, trying to catch up. But that's part of the, of the nature of the race, and I'm quite happy with the way I ran. Off scratch, Jack didn't make things easy for you, did it? Ah, it's all right. You've got to have a stab at these things, though, Jim. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a good hard blowout, and I haven't had many of those in recent weeks. And uh, it's good to be racing Dave again on the track. <laughs> a little while since you, you two have met, isn't it? Yeah, we haven't raced each other that often in the last, mainly because I've been injured and he's been running really well. Um, but it, yeah, <laughs> it's nice to, you know, to, to have a go together. This is obviously the light-hearted stuff before one or two more serious races to come. And I have to ask you both individually, what are the, the prospects for the Olympic Games? You first of all, David. I think it might be easy for me to answer this in a question. I, I think Jack should be selected. And I think next week, the rest of those who run the 5,000 should be running for two places. Um, Jack's had his problems. I'm not, no, I'm not saying this because he's here. He's one of the best in the world. He's just get on and prepare for Seoul. And the rest of us fight out for two places. I'm quite happy with that. Jack, you have had your problems. And I know people are going to wonder, A, if you're going to run in the trials next week or are you going to hold things back a bit? I think I'm going to have to see how I feel tomorrow. I'm going to decide in the next few days. Um, it's very nice of what Dave to say. And I, I, hope, he, I hope he joins me on the plane to see. Um, no, uh, I have come back from my injury quite well. Um, I'm very confident I can be fit in time for the Olympics. I need more races like this. I need to get stuffed uh, over a mile a bit more often, and then I'll start running well at 5,000. Dave, is it fair to say that if you do make career, it will be a huge boost for you, and perhaps an unexpected boost? Yeah, very much so. I, I'm, I'm ever so pleased the way I ran tonight, but you know, I know that I'm not really as fit as maybe I'd like to be, although everybody says that. Um, but I, I, no, based on tonight, I was going to decide whether to run or not next week. I think obviously I'll have to run now and give it a go. And if I can get one of the first two places, that would be great. The only thing I fear is coming third, because then it will be that horrible you know, selector's decision. But I'd just like to make my position you know, absolutely clear that I think that, that you know, Jack should be in there and let him get on with it. OK. David Moorcroft and Jack Buckner, you're both shivering up here, aren't you? Go off and get the tracksuits on. Thanks very much for joining us. And uh, now I think for something completely different here at Meadowbank. Yes, certainly we've seen uh, one of the unusual features in this IAC meeting. That was the handicap mile, the lads were just talking about there. But now another of the innovations that was made a year ago, and again it's turning the clock back. Cycling and athletics used to be two sports that were often combined in the same meeting. And I'm glad to say here alongside me, who knows a little bit more about the two-wheel variety of racing, is David Duffield. David, what's going on? Well, this is uh, Double Take, the hindmost, and in fact, the interest is at the back of the race rather than the front. And so far, we've eliminated uh, three of the riders who have been unfortunate to be last over the line in the finishing straight. So down the back straight now, they sort themselves out. The rider at the top of the screen has just been eliminated, so he's out. And that was one of the young riders, Paul Brown, who just turned pro this year, and was obviously out of his depth because they're jostling for positions and they come down at the finishing straight. And uh, on these road bikes, not uh, racing on the usual track bikes, then they've got to start and wind it up. This is the time. Who's going to be the last man over the line? And uh, Doyle looks comfortable at the front at the moment with Tony James looking over his shoulders. The man at the back is going to be taken out. And that looks like Alan Gornall, who got the chop. And bad luck to Alan Gornall, who was uh, uh, a medalist in the Commonwealth Games a few years ago. Better on the road than the track. And here I think he's found it difficult to find somewhere to go. Of course, the problem is at the front here. Tony 
Doyle is in second place behind Tony James in the pale blue, is that you're going into the wind now and the chaps behind are getting a sheltered ride. So when they swing down the finishing straight, they'll come charging back round uh, the two leaders in the uh, finishing straight here and take advantage of that uh, slipstream. This is Glenn Clark at the back, rides for Emery Amico. Has he got the sprint to get to? And I think he's made, looks over his shoulder and chopped down to the inside. <laughs> the hand goes out from uh, Miller, who spotted the man off the back. And that was Dennis Lightfoot, who had nowhere to go. And a bit of assistance from Miller in the white to help the judges sort out the last man across the line. That's a dangerous thing to do, actually, for Miller, because uh, he's got his left wrist at the moment strapped up and plastered from a crash he had two weeks ago when uh, he cracked some bones in his wrist and rode his bike off. He had to borrow a bike to come up here because, although he's a professional rider, he only got one bike from his sponsor, and now he's had to go and scrounge a bike for this event. Look over his shoulder, that's Miller in the white, but roaring across on the far side. Looks to be close to the camera. It's Clark in good form. He's got through, but it was Miller, I think, this time a wave, and he's now got to go back to the chain room. Yes, it looks like number three. He's freewheeling, and that's Miller out. So let's run down on these riders. At the front, Tony James, followed by Tony Doyle. Behind him is Phil Thomas, a crafty man, twice winner of the Kellogg City Centre races. He's a crafty man. He's now winner of the second place. Robert Dane in uh, third place in the yellow colour. Uh, he was a man who two years ago won a uh, silver medal as a cyclocross rider in the muddy part of the uh, winter season. Now he's on the track here, the Tartan track, which is difficult to ride. It's James, I think, that's going to get the chop. James in the blue, a very good uh, man on the bank track. Tony James better at home in six-day racing, where the bankings are up to 45 degrees, and they go around something like 190 metres per lap. This one, then, a 12-and-a-half lap race. We're down now to just these four riders. On the front, Tony Dorr, twice World Pursuit champion, awarded the OBE for his uh, performances in the uh, international cycling arena because he also won no less than 16 six-day races. And this Dill Take the High Most is a feature of six-day races. Dorr knows what to do. He's on the front. Can Clark come up in time? Oh, I think Clark sold out that time. He's all the way from Australia. We've had two Australians in this race. Petch is already out. Now Clark's gone. Uh, a past uh, Australian champion is now out of the race, leaving Doyle on the front. Crafty Phil Thomas in second place. And uh, Rob Dane is a revelation in third place. Last night he was racing at Hallogate in a very wet and, wet and wendy circuit there. It was terrible conditions. He came off his bike in the second place, looking like he'd been down a coal mine. Now can he come off third place and get through? I don't think he's got the speed in his leg. Certainly last night at Hallogate, he must have sapped the strength for his leg. And he's out. On the bell now. Just these two left. Who's first? Who's second? Well, for my money, Tony Doyle has got the track craft, but Cafty Phil Thomas behind him, the man from Liverpool, who's won uh, no less than uh, two milk race stages, knows how to sprint. Twice Kellogg City Centre specialist too. He can come off a wheel. Can he get off Doyle's wheel? It's Doyle in the lead now. They've got to watch the banking as they go around now because they've got to stop them swinging out. But Doyle's moving out and he's left a gap. But Thomas can't get through. Doyle is winding it up. He's got the power. Thomas can't get past the flying figure of Tony Doyle. That's him. Doyle over the line in first place. Thomas second. The devil take the hindmost. And the man in the lead for most of the race. Our hope for this year's World Pursuit Championship. Tony Doyle. Will he make it three? We'll have to wait and see in the World Championship. But he's in fine form. Tony Doyle, the winner. Could you just talk us through that again, Dave? That was marvellous. <laughs> the commentary was every bit as exciting as the race. Well done. I must say, I didn't understand the moment of it, but you, uh, you certainly made it come alive. Good race, wasn't it? It was, in fact. And Tony Doyle, I didn't think he was uh, having enough strength left uh, at the end of that race because he'd led for so far that all be on his wheel. But he's in very, very fine form at the moment. And I think we must look forward to this man winning the World Championship, uh, the pursuit, in just about, uh, what, six weeks' time. In white... Uh who was riding on motorbike there, knows a bit about cycling. He used to do it himself once. That's why we got those marvellous mobile shots. A real bonus there for cycling fans after the Tour de France recently finished. They saw that on Channel 4. And, of course, the Round Britain cycle race is coming up also on Channel 4. Well, now we're going to move back to slightly more conventional activity in an athletics programme. It's the women's 200 metres, with Paula Dunn of Great Britain on a superb streak at the moment having uh, already done uh, three personal bests at the distance already this season. Here's Alan again. Britain's Paula Dunn runs in lane four in this women's 200 metres. What an improvement she has shown this season. 
although she will be feeling a little bit uh, wary about this race because along with the other athletes she's had something like a 10 minute delay at the start of this race there's a problem with the electronic timing and we've been told that they will hand time this event the full lineup shows a bit of a surprise diane dixon who last week won her place in the united states olympic team over 400 meters here she is in an unusual distance for her running at 200 meters in lane one juliet cuthbert of jamaica in two simone jacobs very good in lane three paula dunn runs in lane four very good american danette young runs in lane five she just missed out on sole selection lane six is empty ingrid verbruggen of belgium runs in lane seven and another english girl louise stewart in lane eight the women's 200 meters then an interesting test for paula dunn with a very strong wind behind their backs and hand timing we can uh, look forward to a very unusual clocking here i'm sure paula dunn right in the center there all in green holding off the net young on that bend but the american girl all in blue is just ahead of her and also going well is diane dixon on the inside and paula dunn behind young and the other american at this stage young wins it paula dunn and diane dixon in a photo for second and third places but the net young who took the bronze medal in the world student games last year but who uh, became like so many of these fine american athletes a victim of their harsh one two three goes a soul system with a fine win there peter the runners had to run into the wind of course around this first bend but then was strongly behind them as they came into the home straight paul dunn's had a lot of races this year but Danette Young is really a top-class, world-class sprinter, and it just shows the quality of the American uh, depth in sprinting. Because look here now as she begins to work her way ahead of Dunn, who probably ends up something like seven metres behind her. Diane Dixon, also a quality 200-metre runner, as well as a 400-metre runner. She's got the strength. But Danette Young, not in the American team for the Olympics, but certainly of the calibre of an Olympic finalist, comes through to win this race, then Dixon and Paula Dunn. I climbed uh, time, the winning time, 22.6, done there probably just outside 23. In fact, an even better 22.5 for Dunn, for Young rather, and Dunn did really very well to get up to second equal in 23.1. Now back live, it's the men's 200 meters that we look forward to next, and a really star-studded lineup here. One of Britain's best, John Regis, will run in lane three here, and there he is, John Regis, the United Kingdom record last year, 20.18. That marvellous bronze medal in the World Championships and a victory in Verona just a couple of days ago in 20.76 to his credit. John Regis, who is a perfectionist at timing his season to peak at exactly the right time as he showed us in Rome with those World Championships last year. Calvin Smith, one of the Americans up against him here, running in lane five used to hold the world record for 100 meters and has twice in 1983 and then again in 1987 lifted the gold medal over 200 meters in the world championship <laughs> there's the full lineup then Addy Maffey in one Todd Bennett in two John Regis runs in lane three Donovan Reed in four Calvin Smith in five James Butler another world-class American sprinter in lane six andy carrot an englishman who's had a very big improvement in his uh, form this year runs in lane seven and jerome fisher of belgium who's really a long jumper in lane eight i think there's going to be a bit of a delay before the start of this race incidentally they seem to have had a lot of technical problems tonight and i gather there's a fault with the blocks now the blocks obviously electronically connected to uh, the starter and uh so Alan, that gives us a chance, in fact, to, uh, while they're waiting for that to be sorted out, to have a look at the high jump, where we've had Dalton Grant, who recently improved the British record to 2 metres 29. He was in action. Third attempt, 2 metres 27, a height which has already been cleared by two Americans, Jim Howard and Hollis Conway. And a fine clearance indeed, and Dalton, uh, Frank, maintaining very fine form here indeed. Uh, Dalton Grant, or Skeletor, as he's known to his friends, very powerful in the weights room very strong fast free thigh wriggles over the bar a good clearance uh, he's sort of the new generation high jumper from great britain's point of view bags of strength training and no longer the sort of situation where we've got high jumpers looking like a pipe cleaner on a high fiber diet 
and in fact uh, that was uh, his ultimate clearance in the competition two meters 27 no one else jumped higher and as the americans uh, had cleared 227 on their first attempt it was jim howard first hollis conway second dalton grant third all 227 but again good jumping there by the english athlete strange that uh, both these 200 meters races have been affected whereas the other sprints uh, tonight weren't by this electronic timing fault frank yeah i'm uh, more than a little bit interested in this particular race because uh, if we think of another event in the olympic games the four by 100 meters okay. the americans normally run carvin smith on the uh, third leg and that's precisely where i'm hoping to run john regis so we get a pretty good picture of how they can handle the bend here okay well we can go through the lanes again they're only a couple of minutes away from the start now because i think the problem has been solved this is daddy mappy now 21 he made the olympic final when he was just 17 in 1984 he's had a couple of lean years since then but now promising to come back to his best again mappy runs in lane one for england todd bennett what a great competitor he has been over the years he's still only 26 actually although he seems to have been around for heck of a long time the former english record holder vital member of our relay squad over 400 meters and of course uh, it was in the shorter distance that he took the silver medal in the commonwealth games on this very track in 1986 that's todd bennett in lane two john regis world bronze medalist runs in lane three high hopes of him for Seoul. donovan reed is next to him in lane four runner up in this year's united kingdom championships and one of the many bidding for places for Seoul in uh, this event. Calvin Smith, double world champion of the United States in lane five. The other American, James Butler, was only sixth in the United States trials, but of course it was a, a staggeringly high quality race, as indeed most of the sprints were in Indianapolis. Here's the young Andy Carrot, the 22-year-old from Worcester, Midland champion in lane seven. And the Belgium Fisher is also just 22 in lane eight. Big race this for John Regis, Frank, particularly John. Yeah, we should see a big contrast here between the very fast starting of Calvin Smith and Butler as opposed to the big kick off the bend and powerful straight of John Regis. John Regis still only 21. I'll start uh, made by Donovan Reed, I think, in lane four. I suppose one of the uh, question marks over selections for Sol Frank is uh, Linford Christie and whether he's going to uh, want to do both 100 and 200 metres, as Sir Donovan Reed acknowledges his false start. Yeah, I think uh, should uh, Linford decide to go for both, I think he'll give a, an, an extraordinary performance in both. He's certainly worth both finals, uh, and I think if we've got John uh, and Linford in the 200 metres, we'll see two Britons there remind you that the selection policy this year is that the first two in the trials that's joint trials for men and women being held in Birmingham next weekend and you can see them only on ITV the first two in each event will automatically be selected for Seoul the team is named the very next day that's Monday morning of next week and uh, the selectors at their discretion will pick the third athlete in each event what an event that's going to be John Regis no matter how many medals you've got and what your status is in the sport, you'll be amongst those having a very nervous few days between now and Birmingham next weekend. Calvin Smith's had his uh, anxiety. Only fifth, incidentally, over 200 metres in the uh, United States trials, but made it in the 100 metres. Better start this time, and certainly Butler did get away quickly in lane six there, all in blue, and has run a very, very strong first bend. John Regis, all in the, the multicolored kit, running very well too in lane three. Butler still leading, Regis coming back at him. In between those two is Calvin Smith as well. The two Americans dominate, but Regis gets third place. As you can see, the electronic clock failed to stop there, so we can only give you a hint of the timing. But uh, Calvin Smith and James Butler 
proving the better on this occasion of the English athletes in the field. But let's uh, repeat that the Americans have just been really up for their trials and uh, they're still a week away for these English guys, Frank. British guys, I should say. Yeah, well, I think John put in just a bit too much work in the bend. He knew how fast these Americans were on the bend and put it, made a big commitment. He does not normally do that. Once up there, he's a target for Calvin Smith. Uh, Calvin running lightly. As I say, these guys have just had uh, top-level competition. John's is still to come. All of John's speed is now in front of him. And at this point, he's thinking to himself, is it worth the race? Or do I keep myself for a place next weekend? Winning time there, I made 20.5 unofficially hand time. It's interesting to see Todd Bennett running well also, got up into fourth place. Smith, Butler and Regis then the 1-2-3 in that 200 metres. And uh, three of those who will be very much involved in the selection process, Mike Turner in the wintry hat, Les Jones and Pam Piercy, they'll all be uh, deliberating next weekend about who will get the places in Britain's Olympic team. Well, coming up next, can Limford Christie give his rivals a head start and still beat them? We'll find out after the break. and the news are making headlines at our price. Huey Lewis and the News with the hit single from their great new album, Small World. Find it now in the galaxy of music at over 200 our price record shops. When people come together, they make a force to be reckoned with. And over one and a half million people make Standard Life one of the largest mutual life assurance companies in Europe. And as we don't have any shareholders, there's more for the people who entrust their pensions and savings to our experts. Standard Life. We're better off together. <laughs> Boy, oh boy, that looks just like a quaver. Hey, this one, this one smells like a quaver. I wonder if they taste like quavers. They are quavers. <laughs> quavers, watch out, they taste curly. This is the best of Billy Idol. All his greatest hits singled out on one essential album. Accept nothing less. the Orient Express, please. What's this? Yes, those shredded wheat chappies are giving away a corker of a prize. Sixty cheery couples will journey across Europe on the world's most famous train. Enter now for the trip of a lifetime. Cricket, no rugby, no squash, no fishing, no snooker, no darts, no women wrestling in mud. So what have they got? 23 different sports. 23? Like what? Archery, volleyball, canoeing. Volleyball? Canoeing? And tennis. For the first time since 1924. Ah, they want the real spirit of the Olympics, eh? Of course they do. So they send for John McEnroe. They got table tennis for the first time. Ping pong? Church all stuff. What is this? It's the Olympics on four. Watch it. The 
remarkable being able to discover that 2,000 years old film, wasn't it? Well, there is indeed comprehensive coverage of the Olympics on Channel 4 and indeed on ITV and the Olympic trials you can see starting a week tonight on ITV. Right, it's back to Medibank this evening now. The 3,000 metres, including Liz McColgan, is already underway. So let's rejoin our commentators, Peter Matthews, Frank Dick and Alan Parry. Four and a half laps to go in this 3,000 metres and a very familiar leader there, Liz McColgan, on the scene of her Commonwealth gold medal triumph two years ago on this track since which time she really has got better and better. Running in second place is Sabrina Dornhofer of the United States, wearing number two, who uh, just a little over a week ago was taking part in a rather more important race in vastly different conditions. She was in the 1500 meters and the 3000 meters in the American Olympic trials. And the temperature in the 3000 was measured on the track at 122 degrees. And Dornhofer, there number two, collapsed and fell in the heat but uh, it's a good deal cola on this Edinburgh evening she'll be relieved the Colgan leads then Dornhofer second Stanescu of Romania is in third place in the yellow vest but uh, Liz McColgan obviously attracting most of the interest and Frank she has been showing the kind of form this year that really suggests that the remark made by a coach John Anderson that one day she'll be the greatest woman athlete in the world is one not to be taken lightly. No, I'd agree with that. Uh, she's not presently heading the world rankings in the 10,000 meters. Uh, and uh, when you consider the quality of women's 10,000 meters at the moment, that's quite an achievement. Bit of a hard job tonight. Strong wind up the back straight and she's keeping, she's certainly sheltering the other athletes behind her. Her purpose in doing this sort of work, this, uh, this late in the season, is really time trial type stuff, looking at the speed over a slightly shorter distance. Uh, but tonight, I guess, she would have hoped for calmer conditions to post a fast time. Now she's looking, really, at a result. Three laps to go, McColgan leads, Dornhofer second, Stanescu in third, Mary Donahue, the Irish athlete, is fourth, all in black, and just behind her, also all in black, is the 26-year-old English girl, Nicola Morris, wearing number six. McColgan, the 24-year-old from Dundee, married to Peter McColgan, the international steeplechaser. They met while Liz was in the United States at the University of Alabama, where the marked improvement in her form really began to show. Well, Liz has been a bit of pressure on now. She's broken the field a little bit. I was expecting Stanescu of Romania to, to feature highly in this race, but she's dropped off the pace, and you now have a straight, a straight race between Sabrina Dornhofer and, uh, of course, Liz. I'm really put, quite impressed at uh, Sabrina Dornhofer because the trouble she was in last week, I'm very surprised she's running this early. Yes, I don't know if uh, many of you actually saw that race, but it was like the end of a marathon, really, in the heat. Dornhofer, number two there, fell as she was stride for stride with Patty Sue Plummer and the line approaching got up, staggered over the line again, and excruciatingly for her, finished fourth and didn't make the Olympic team. Two to go, and the crowd really getting behind the Scottish girl here. Well, Liz, Liz is definitely not going to leave the pace up to anyone else in this race. She felt a little bit of pressure in the home straight and has decided to try to put a long press from home. Well, we haven't got a time on this. The timing is broken down again. But just to give you an indication, the pace at which they're running, they're running about 70-second laps at the moment. And look at them really straining into the teeth of that wind there. The wind has not dropped at all. In fact, if anything, I guess it's got stronger down that back straight. The flag's on the top of the stadium, blowing very, very hard, and they're running right into the wind now. McColgan and Dawn offer in their own race, really, and the rest some 30 metres or more back chasing third place and Liz is really making her work now that was hard work up the back straight but I don't think Donhover wants to be shaken off here we're going to have quite a fast last lap but it looks to me now as though Liz is beginning to pick up the pace again with the wind of the back but it's beginning to open the gap that she needs and if she needs home support she's got it in abundance so number four Liz McColgan reaches the bell there is stretching away now from the American challenger, Dornhofer. She's just on the last 200 metres in 33 seconds, and after a 71 second lap, that shows the injection of pace. Well, they say at the top end, it's not so much, the, 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 the secret of success is not so much how fast you can run, but how quickly you can change your pace. She's done just that. 
and this is a very powerful finish, the sort of finish that will frighten her top opposition from all around the world. An amazingly tough girl, isn't she? She uh, weighs just seven and a half stone. She looks so slight when you watch her running from the stands here, but she's tough physically and even tougher mentally with this prodigious capacity for hard work, this enormous mileage, and yet this terrific speed. 32.8 even into the wind for that last 200 metres. And we're looking here at a girl who could be one of Britain's biggest hopes for a medal. And a goal one at that in Seoul. She's already beaten her main rival, Ingrid Christensen, over two distances this season. And in front of our home crowd, Liz McColgan scores another impressive victory. The runner-up, Dawn Hopper of the United States, a long way behind. And then even further back, a very good Romanian, Stănescu, in third. Donahoe of Ireland was four. 31.8 last 200 metres, 249.4 last thousand, Frank. Very impressive. But I'm absolutely delighted. Uh, I think Liz has got things well on course. And uh, 10 out of 10 to John Anderson for putting in a, a really great winter and a fantastic preparation for the Olympics. She'll certainly enjoy this lap of honour in front of a Scottish crowd that gave her the biggest response of the night. Very impressive piece of running that uh, by Liz McColgan. Goodness me, she looked strong as she went past me for that final lap. Well, a good crowd here uh, in Edinburgh. It's getting distinctly chilly, but nobody is leaving the stadium because of the appearance of Harry Butch Reynolds. He's going to be coming up in the men's 400 metres. And now it's a chance for us to enjoy the 400 metres once again from the American Olympic trials last weekend. An absolutely astonishing standard, really. Eight men below 45 seconds in the final. Another five broke that 45 second mark and weren't good enough to make the final at all. Of course, Reynolds starting as the favourite, but watch out for Steve Lewis, a 19-year-old who's broken four world junior records in 1988. They're stride for stride in the home straight, and Danny Everett in lane four, all in blue. Also going well, in fact, Everett just in front. Reynolds coming back at him. What a race it's been, and Reynolds wins it. Everett second, Lewis third, and the time, an incredible 43.95, the first ever sub 44 seconds at sea level. The official time later reduced, of course, to 43.93. The fastest race in history at sea level, and surely Butch Reynolds on the verge of breaking the world record that has stood for 20 years. He has now the two fastest crossings ever without the benefit of altitude. Only Lee Evans in Mexico City, winning the Olympic gold 20 years ago, has ever run faster. And Danny Everett, incidentally, in the same race, also forced himself into the world all-time top four. Crowd in the background still uh, applauding Liz McColgan for her earlier victory in the 3,000 metres. And Liz will be an interested spectator now for this World Class 400 metres. Here he is, Butch Reynolds. He's already run the fastest 400 ever seen in Europe. That was at Crystal Palace on his first venture outside the United States of America when he came here last year, ran a very, very busy schedule in his European tour, a schedule that was eventually blamed for his relative failure in the world championships where he only took the bronze medal he was also uh, suffering from a stomach bug that week 24 years from ohio went to the ohio state university the same university that the great jesse owens attended and he used to walk past his statue every day and gain inspiration from it and ed moses another of the all-time great american athletes has been another big influence in his career now, in the same race here, as if it isn't bad enough having to run against Butch Reynolds, the athletes will be seeing double, because this is Jeff Reynolds, the younger brother of Butch, and uh, he, would you believe, in the American trials, failed to make the semi-finals, even though he ran 44.98. And that, I think, uh, if anything, just underlines the astonishing standard of one that running in America. 
We'd hope to have uh, Ines Neg Beniki and uh, Derek Redmond in this race as well, but both of them have had to pull out because of injuries. But nonetheless, a good British representation here, Paul Harmsworth, bronze medalist in the European Indoor Championships a year ago. He runs in lane one. That's Clarence Daniel, the American, seventh in the trials and second in the earlier in the season American Championships. He's in lane two. And we've already heard how the Scots get behind their own athletes, and they surely will now for Brian Whittle, the United Kingdom champion, having the best start to a season he's ever had, the 24-year-old Scottish athlete, silver medalist in this year's European Indoor Championships. Jeff Reynolds runs in lane four, younger brother of Butch. They were both great basketball players at college as well, by the way, and could have taken that uh, sport up in a big way. Butch Reynolds runs in lane five, In lane six is Andrew Valmont, who also made the American uh, Trials final and finished in sixth place. That's Valmont, number seven, with the best ever of 44.79. In lane seven, there he is, wearing number three, is Yuapai of Finland who actually had a notable scalp to his credit earlier this season when he beat Gabriel Tianco of the Ivory Coast in a meeting in Helsinki. And nearer the camera there, the 21-year-old Miles Murphy, the new Australian record holder and the world junior champion. Frank, quite a lineup. It certainly is. Tough job for, for the British boys. Uh, if we go think back to Miles Murphy there, he's one of a quartet of uh, top Australians who our British boys are well aware are serious challengers uh, for medals in Seoul. Although the pictures look beautifully clear and crisp on your monitors, hopefully back home, your TV sets, I can tell you it's pretty dark and gloomy and windy here now. More like a winter's evening than a summer's evening in Edinburgh. But Brian Whittle's used to the vagaries of the Scottish weather. The men's 400 metres, including Arguably the greatest talent ever unearthed in this event, Butch Reynolds. Reynolds in lane five, all in white, and in the trials with uh, that phenomenal Steve Lewis outside him, he ran a blistering first 200 meters. Whittle has gone off very, very strongly here. Whittle really enjoying the challenge of running against the world's best and has made a very good start. Reynolds, as you'd expect, in a good position too in the center of the track. And Miles Murphy, the Australian, running blind, so to speak, in the outside lane, also well placed. Murphy nearest to the camera, Reynolds in the middle, Whittle, and inside Whittle, Clarence Daniel. It's Butch Reynolds out in front. Andrew Valmont coming on strongly on his inside, and he'll take second place in lane six. And on the inside, I think it was Clarence Daniel who got third. Uh, once again, we've got a problem with the clock. But uh, round about 45.3, 45.4. That's right. And uh, Cheshire's uh, Brian Whittle, I got in 47.1. And that's the difference in class there at the moment, Frank. Oh, sure. But I, I do admire Brian's courage in trying to go out very fast. In the old days, the idea was to run hard to 200 meters and hope that you didn't lose more than two seconds on your first 200 meters time on the second one. Nowadays, it's even pacing. And that's precisely what this man did. He paced himself very well all the way through, and in very windy conditions, not a bad time. Reynolds, Valmont, and Daniel then, an all-American trio in the leading places. And Butch Reynolds hopefully won't suffer the fate he suffered on his previous visit to Scotland when he was disqualified, having run brilliantly in an indoor meeting earlier in the winter. Well, lots more to come here, including the appearance of Linford Christie very soon. We'll have more live action from Edinburgh. Join us again soon. I'd like a 
Choices pension plan, please. Ah, yes. Choices. A pension you can keep no matter what you do in your working life. Yeah? Ooh. Pension you can take from job to job. That's it. A pension that stays with you whether you're fully employed, self-employed, or taking time off to have babies. Yeah. <laughs> you got it. One that makes no difference if you work in the same firm for 40 years mm. or get bored with it after six months and go off to be a tugboat driver, toothbrush yeah. salesman, lifesaver, <laughs> professional Morris dancer, mm. balloonist, traffic uh, warden, uh, yeah, traffic warden uh, pastry cook, paleontologist, plumber, lion tamer, and church warden. Not necessarily in that order. You got it. Because whatever you do, a choice's pension will be waiting for you when you retire. That's the one! Left it a bit late, haven't you? Well, it hasn't been available till now, has it? Choices from Guardian Royal Exchange, a pension plan that lets you go on making choices, provided you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. What you got today, then? Oh, just a little tomato, crisp lettuce, and cool, creamy Philadelphia spread thick on granary bread. Oh. What you got today, then? Crisp crunchy celery, lashings of creamy Philadelphia, and a little Lolo Rosso for that continental touch. <laughs> nice. What's that, then? Just Philadelphia. Just Philadelphia? It is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. <coughs> Hi. Uh, My friend and I are here today to talk about Kestrel Lager. He's the one that can do all that wrinkle stuff. Uh, but we both know about bite. You see, Kestrel's a lager that's carefully brewed to bring out that certain bite in the taste. What's making you so nervous? I've never been on TV before. Kestrel, people who know about bite, buy it. Feel like dinner? The Condor's no price here. Oh, Condor mild. Same old Condor, such a mild have been sort of thing. Oh, well, welcome aboard, old boy. Yes, I vividly remember my first pipe full of Condor. We were just rounding the Cape. We were trying to up. The captain turned to me and said, What time Nothing is should disturb oh, yeah. that Condor moment. There are 23 sports in the 88 Olympics. That was 23 sports in 9.99 .9 seconds, the Olympic record for the 100 meter sprint. That was 23 sports in 19.80 seconds, the Olympic record for the 200-meter sprint. On Saturday, September the 17th, in real time, the Olympics are under starter's orders, Channel 4. Yes, do not adjust your sets. This is uh, Olympics, Channel 4 style, and this is International Athletics on Channel 4 here in Edinburgh. One of the most famous landmarks in this beautiful city, dominating the Meadowbank Stadium, the scene of two Commonwealth Games in 1970 and 1986. And now, about to witness a most unusual event indeed, the 110 metres handicap. Linford Christie will be running here off scratch, and if you were watching earlier in the ITV programme, you may have seen his superb performance in the semi-final. He's running against a couple of guys here who used to be professional sprinters, up in Scotland, and they have a lead over him, as you can see there, of distances varying from six and a half to eight meters. Now, Linford Christie made light of that uh, handicap in his heat. Let's see what he can do again here in the final. Christie made a good start. Watch for David Clark in main five, the Scotsman. Here comes Christie late again, but this time the handicap proves too great. But even 
so. It was another brilliant run by them to Christie because he reduced that gap between himself and Clark, which was seven metres when the gun went to, well, just a few strides, Frank. A fantastic run. Linford in full flight is, in my opinion, unbeatable this season. We've seen that in his back straight running in the, in the 4 by 100 metres relay. Uh, but in this particular race, the problem was bound to be the experience of David Clark as a former professional who's run many, many times handicap races. Uh, as I said earlier, he had this, uh, th this run where he knew all that he had to do to show Linford where his strengths were for the final. Up came the final, and David actually produced another notch to beat him. Nonetheless, it was extraordinary time because I've uh, hand timed only, admittedly, timed him for Christie, and I got him in around 10 8, 10 8, 10 9. Well, that's sub 10 second running. Okay, they got a win behind him, but that really is very impressive. I quite like the, this lad, Dave Clark, though. You know, he's just come through from the professional ranks. He finished second in both the 100 and the 200 last week. He's a strong boy, a lot of professional background in sprint training, and I think we'll see quite a bit of him in future. Linford's start was very, very powerful. But I say his, the, the, the secret of Linford's success is his full flight running. This phase here, look at it, running tall, lifting the knees, the knees high, full arm action, works all the way through the line. I tell you, there'll be very few people to hold Linford Christie in the back straight of the 4 by 100 metres in the Olympic Games. Incidentally, the bloke on his outside there, Dennis Mitchell, was second to Carl Lewis in the Olympic trials, and Linford beat him by a couple of metres. Now then, Linford, you came, uh, you came flying through at uh, us and at George McNeil, watching at the end, uh, end of the straight. Uh, just a bit too much ground there for you, or what? Uh, yeah, I think, I think the gap between me and the other guys was a little bit too much. Was there any stage where you thought you might do it? Well, you know, I, I began to pick up nearer to the line, but I thought, you know, when I leaned over the line, I thought maybe second or so, but uh -huh. it was really tough. George, what about yourself? How much does uh, hanging on to this record still mean to you? To be honest, I never really thought about it until the, the promoters came up with the idea. I'm just pleased that at least it's had some publicity after 17 years. <laughs> right. And uh, it was a, ter a tremendous run. I don't know the time yet. But. No. Would you fancy just turning the clock back perhaps and going off scratch against this fella? Not really. No, I think he's. I think things have progressed forward. And I think for him to give uh, Dave Clark, to try and give him seven metres a start is a tremendous uh -huh. effort. Right. Linford, a fun event here, but uh, serious stuff uh, next weekend. Uh, I'm afraid so, you know. I mean, the stadium is fun, but to me, I mean, this was serious too, because obviously you tried to win. And maybe I could have done a bit of coaching from George beforehand. <laughs> but, you know, as for next week, I'm going in, I'm going to run both events, you know, because I think I need the races now and see what happens. We'll see you in Birmingham. Linford, George, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Rosenthal there, talking to Linford Christie and George McNeil. Right. It is, of course, the Olympic Games coming up in September, but before that, we've got the Olympic trials. Absolutely crucial to find out who are going to be in the British team to travel to Seoul. And you can see that only on independent television. The Olympic Stadium in Seoul is the target for every British athlete at the trials next Friday, Saturday and Sunday. It's going to be the most dramatic meeting for many years. You can follow all the best action only here on ITV. Reputations count for nothing. Only the first two past the post are guaranteed a ticket to Korea. The competitors must produce the goods on the day. Otherwise, years of training could be wasted. It's a new and controversial method of selecting a team, and we can guarantee you an outstanding event. The Olympic Trials live and exclusive on ITV and Channel 4. I'll be there. I hope you will be too. Steve says it, surely that's good enough for you. Right, let's catch up with some of the results of this evening here at Meadowbank in the IAC Miller Lite International. Here's Peter Matthews. Well, one of the outstanding results was Sally Gunnell's 12.80, better than the British record, although wind assisted at 3.3, beating two good Americans, Talbot and Page. And the men's 110 metre hurdles, Colin Jackson, a wind assisted 13.21. The fastest time ever for Tony Jarrett, 13.35. And great to see Gaunt, John Ridgen back in good form, third, 13.45, ahead of the good Americans. The men's 1,000 metres, Saida Witter, 2.18.32, and David Sharp out kicking Tom McKean. Thanks to Peter Matthews. And that's it from Meadowbank this evening in Edinburgh. A very breezy evening, but we still had some tremendously entertaining athletics. We've seen Saida Witter against uh, Tom McKean, 
that superb high hurdles with Jackson, Ridgeon and Jarrett. And a display of power running from Butch Reynolds. Remember the Olympic trials next weekend from now from Meadowbank. Good night. American football at Wembley. The Miami Dolphins and the San Francisco 49ers fight it out for the American Bowl Sunday at 10.15 on Channel 4. Touchdown!